Y'all ready to get in the Word? Amen. I'm catching my breath here just a little bit in case you want. We're going to read God's Word together. That means we need to stand up and honor that. Reading today from the book of Ephesians. Yeah, I don't know how many of you remember this or not, but uh, a few Sundays ago, I read a text, and I said I almost used another text, this text. I haven't been able to get away from it. So, so we're going to Ephesians chapter 5 today, beginning with verse 15. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Bow with me for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, your word says, that what we've just read is a mystery. But I pray that your Holy Spirit give us understanding and revelation today in the truth of your word. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Anoint me to bring forth what you've given me to give them. Lord, anoint them to hear and to receive and all of us to respond in a way that pleases you. We thank you for it, and we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, what an exciting time we're living in. God's people, I'm, I'm happy to say that I really believe this church, my church, our church is seeking God and asking Him to draw us to a higher place in Him. Amen? We had a wonderful turnout last week to Ash Wednesday. I want to encourage you to make Wednesday the time of prayer. God said His house would be a house of prayer. We're investing in revival on Wednesdays. I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. 
your investment is making a difference. But today's message, we're picking up on our series, Real Church. This is Real Church 3, but I subtitled it, Engaged. Engaged. A little over 50 years ago, on the shore of Hartwell Lake in Hartwell, Georgia, I asked Sheila Royston if she would be my wife. And she said, yes. I had bought a little diamond ring from Fink's Jewelers in Roanoke. I don't know if Fink's is still in business. For years, they were the kind of the premium jeweler. And I had uh, come up with enough money to get a little diamond ring and... and uh, put it on her finger, and we were engaged to be married. At that time, I was in college at Emmanuel College, as I said earlier. I lived in the dorm on campus. There was only one boy's dorm then, well and tall. And she was a senior at Franklin County High School. Now, in those days, young people, we didn't have cell phones. There was no such thing as texting. There was no such thing as Facebook and Messenger and all that digital stuff. But there was a little closet. I mean, just, I mean, I I don't know. I guess it was originally designed to be a broom closet. But there was a little closet on the second floor of Wellens Hall that housed the payphone. And I would stay on that phone till the other boys in the dorm would get weary with me. They'd be out there banging on that door. Hey, how about somebody else get a chance on the phone? We'd sp- every day, Sheila and I, if we, had, if we hadn't been together, we would be on that phone for an hour at a time. If... That wasn't the case. Every opportunity we had, we we were together, even if it meant me sneaking off campus. See, this was a Christian college. Things have really changed a lot. Back in those days, if you left college campus, you had to sign out. You had to state a, a reasonable good reason. And you had a certain time, to a curfew to be back. Uh, all sorts of things. But I would slip off because she lived just a few blocks from the campus. And I'd slip off on foot and go over there. One day I was over there and somebody called her house phone and said, Hey, if Steve's there, he better get out of there. Mr. Henson's on his way over there. <laughs> he, and I slipped out. And was actually across the street behind a pine tree when Mr. Mr. Henson drove up to check on things. If I would drive home for the weekend, once again, you young people don't know anything about this. But the long distance bill, we talk long distance. I mean, this was even before prepaid phone cards. You know, the phone company kept track of this. We talked long distance for quite some long time. I'm giving you all a little history, but the point of all of this is, for us, our lives became focused on one another instead of so much ourselves. We wanted to please each other. We wanted to make each other happy. We wanted to be together forever. And we were willing to make some concessions in order to do that and to build a life and a home together. We talked a lot about that. Well, I could go into a lot of stuff right now. But I'm going to go into just a little bit for the help of our young people or maybe some of our older people that are dating. We had some very frank conversations she was a Christian and I was called I was a Christian and called to ministry. We talked about sex 
but we agreed that we would wait until we got married, and we did. We did. Because we knew that's what God's standard would be if we were going to please Him. Stephen Sheila, by God's grace and by God's Spirit, became one on August the 10th, 1973. And if you calculators run in this past August, made 50 years for us. And in public, we represent each other in every way. I want you to understand, every, every little st- sentence I'm making right now is going to tie in with a biblical lesson. In public, we represent each other in every way. In private, she can be my harshest critic or my fiercest defender. Let me tell you what. She can get me straightened out when I need to. But if you're going to try to straighten me out and she's around, I'll tell you right now. She's going to defend me. That's the way we roll and vice versa. We understand that we complete each other. It is no longer mine and hers, but it's ours. I could take another rabbit trail there, but I, I'm, I, I got too much ground to cover. Jesus said, if we understand some of this stuff that I just illustrated in that little uh, preview or, 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 of our lives, And what the Word said, he said, if we can understand that at all, we can begin to understand the Lord's relationship with His church. If we can understand that, we can begin to understand His view of the relationship we have with Him. You see, Jesus and His church are engaged. There's been a proposal. We're engaged. How many of you know there's a marriage supper that's being prepared and we're invited? There is a holy, righteous Savior that is coming soon for His bride to be with Him forever. He wants to be with His church forever. The Word of God says that He is preparing her and that He will present her a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she will be holy and without blemish. I hope you realize today that He is preparing us. And I read in Revelation, the 19th chapter this morning, He said that her church has made herself ready. Amen. It's good preaching, Pastor. Let me tell you what. The mind and the focus of our Lord has always been and will always be His church. Now is the time when we, the church, are allowing Him To draw our mind and our heart into being made ready for Him. Now in an earlier session, again this is session three on this subject. I say it all the time, but if you missed one and two, our YouTube channel has it. All you got to do is go to Valley Harvest Ministries and type in Real Church and all three of them will come up after today. But in an earlier session, I said the characteristic of real church and every historical historical revival has been a return to a focus on holiness. Holiness. Let me define holiness for us today in a way that I believe is very easy to understand. Holiness is when we commit our lives 
to please the Lord in every way. That's what holiness is. Holiness is when we commit to serving the Lord with our heart. We get our heart into it. That's holiness. Holiness is when we say yes to the Lord and accept the ring to be His forever. Holiness is when we realize that all of our thoughts and all of our ways must be surrendered to Him. Holiness is when we realize that we have been called unto sanctification and holiness. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. It means that we understand that Jesus paid a great price to bring us out of sin and its bondage and to set us in a place of liberty and freedom to serve Him. I hope today that you are realizing that you are saved, but you have been made free from sin and its bondage. Holiness means that we consecrate ourselves unto Him. In other words, we purpose that by God's help and grace, we will be true to Him. We'll be true to Him and His Word at all times. We will Watch this. this. This is what it means. It means that we will represent Him I don't think probably any of y'all can hear Steve Willis mention that you don't maybe subconsciously recognize Sheila's in that picture somewhere. You don't run into Sheila out here in Walmart or wherever you go and, rec- and fail to recognize Steve's around somewhere. It means that we represent and that we are identified with Him rather than the world. You know, another side journey here. This ain't in the notes. But I, I see, and I'm not picking on young people. I'm trying to help young people. I was one one time. I still am. I'm just trapped in an old man's body. (laughs) Never did grow up. (laughs) Ain't planning to. But I see especially young people, every little fad and every little thing that people seem to think this is cool and everybody's doing it and young people just feel like they got to be they got to do it because they they want to be identified with the cool gang you know this is all about you and me deciding we're not so much interested in being identified with anything in this world as much as we are interested in being identified with him See, we got his name. Christian. Christian. Christ like. So I want to ask you, I want to challenge you. I believe to some degree most of us are, but. I believe God's going to help us with this this morning and bring us to a new level. I want to ask you if you're consecrated before Him. Consecration and sanctification mean very, they're very similar. They're almost synonyms. 
But to be sanctified, here's what it means. To be set apart unto the Lord. When Sheila put that ring on 50 years ago, that said to the world, that little blonde-headed thing is already spoken for. Boys, y'all just, you know, just let her alone. Keep looking. She's, she's spoken for already. Amen? When it comes to be sanctified and consecrated, it means that you and I walk around with this consciousness all the time. I belong to Him. I'm not my own. I belong to Him. He, he's not only, man, He's not only spoken for me. He has demonstrated how much He, to the extent He has been willing to go in order to win me. He laid down His life for me. Every hour, every minute, every day, you and I walk around. There should be this very real consciousness that we have. I belong to the Lord. I belong to Him. I can't be playing the field anymore. I, I can't act like I haven't been spoken for. I want to give you some scriptures for this. I'm going to give you three because Scripture says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, I'm going to give you three verses. Y'all can all quote this one. It says, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 1 Corinthians says this, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And watch this. You are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 2 Corinthians 6 chapter says this, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We're talking about being consecrated set apart because we belong to the Lord. Holiness means that we recognize we've been called out. And watch this. We are both humbled and honored to be different than the world in order to be recognized by heaven. If some of y'all don't put that on the, that quote right, I'm going to put it on myself. Holiness means that we recognize we've been called out and we are humbled and honored to be different than the world in order to be recognized of heaven. I hope you're humbled. The fact that God chose you and asked you to be His forever. What an honor. Let's move on. Sanctification. It means that we've received God's gift of grace in view of a complete work in our lives. He didn't just forgive our sins, guys. There's too many Christians walking around today who think that's all it is. That's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful to have our sins forgiven. It's wonderful to know that the slate was Wiped clean, and our name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But He didn't stop there, and we can't. He didn't just forgive our sins, but He cleanses us from its effects. And He empowers us to live lives of righteousness and holiness before Him. Well, there's another good quote. He empowers us by grace to live lives of righteousness and holiness. 
didn't Paul say? I used to be bound to sin, but now I am bound to righteousness. Sanctification means that by faith you receive God's grace to break sin's power off of your life and to make you keenly aware of the Spirit that is constantly pulling you toward a life of righteousness and holiness. I hope that you are aware of that today. Jesus is active all the time. And all the time, he's active to change us. He's he's active to change, to transform, to cleanse, and to mature us in the faith. And one day, that's what his word says, one day, he's going to present us perfect before the Father. No, I'm not perfect right now. You're not either. Uh, Doubt if that's revelation to anybody. But we have God's word on this. One day, when the work that Jesus is doing in our lives is finished, he's going to present us perfect before the Father. Philippians says, He who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. He's not going to stop before the job's done. Don't you? Don't you quit believing and following and letting him work? He's he's committed just like when you got engaged. He's committed for eternity to perfect you. Man, alive, it's good stuff, isn't it? Holiness is when we fully subscribe to righteous and holy living. Have you fully subscribed? Is that what your is that your goal? Is that is that the are you pressing toward that mark to righteous and holy living? We subscribe to it. By the blood and by the word and by the spirit of God. That means that we allow him to continually address the sin in our lives and to clean it out. You know what? Here's, here's, here's something I notice. Now with all of this potential and all of this opportunity, here's what I notice. There's some Christians that just let the same old stuff be a part of their life and you know they don't they don't really come to the place where they're ready to let God straighten it out take it out purge it out cleanse it empower them they they're not ready for that so they they just kind of keep walking in it but holiness is when we allow God to continually address the sin in our lives and clean it out What is sin? I gave you a good definition for holiness. I'm going to give you one for sin. A quick, easy answer is sin is anything that displeases God. If there's something going on in your life that grieves God's spirit, if there's something going on in your life that is not Christ-like, The Bible says it's sin. It can be a habit. It can be an attitude. It can be a word, an action. Watch this. It can be a reaction. If it doesn't honor God, if it does not represent Him well, it's a sin. I don't remember what the situation was. He probably does. A few weeks ago, Pastor Perry, I don't know if he left me a message or sent me a text, but there was something that had taken place in our fellowship 
that when he got away, he, it grie- he felt grieved about it. And he sent me a note. He said, Pastor, I, I didn't mean this the way it seemed. And I've repented. I just want to tell you. And I can relate to that. There have been times in my life that I got away from a situation and I realized, boy, I just didn't handle that right. I had to go back and fix it. Uh, you know, that's what sin is. That's how God continually works in our lives. Now, let's continue to talk about sin. You know, some things are a sin for anybody and everybody. And some things might be a sin for you, but not for somebody else. I got to unpack that a little bit. If the Bible says that it's sin, it's sin. You got that? Everybody got that? I mean, if God's got it spelled out and He says, this is sin. Or if you read in Proverbs and he says, here's something I hate. If you're reading, this, if you're reading the, the scripture somewhere and it says that the Father abhors that, you can rest assured debate is over. That is sin for everybody. There's a lot of stuff that people, and I marvel at even people in the church seem to be wrestling with today. It's just black and white in the Scripture. I don't know how you can, I don't know. You see, the world that we live in has a new definition for everything. Have you noticed that? Some people today that call themselves Christians, but they don't have a problem with things that God very clearly abhors. So there's no need for us to argue about it. There's no need for us to debate or vacillate on them. We just go by the word. If God says it's sin, if he says it's wrong and forbidden, it doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what our society embraces or legalizes. You don't get to decide what's sin and what's not. God already did that. I said God already did that. And if you're going to belong to the Lord and enjoy all the benefits of covenant with Him, what He says is is right, and it's true, and it will be the standard by which everyone is judged by. Holiness is when we are truly committed to the revelation of God's Word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit at all times. Now I want to talk about that word a little bit. Conviction. Seems like we don't hear much about it anymore. I don't think people know too much about it anymore. What does conviction mean? It means that we realize that God is faithful to give us revelation and guidance by that inner small voice. Of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was a, most of you know, I, I grew up as an only child. I, had, I would have had a sister that died before, right before I was born. So, uh, and my parents were old enough when I was born till I was, you know, there wasn't going to be any more. I mean, so I grew up as an only child. And as a result of that, my mom, I, I would ask her, I, I, when I think back on it, I realize that, man, I ask her some tough questions. I ask her some questions that might have even been a little awkward for a boy to be asking his mama about things I didn't understand. And I wanted to understand. And I wanted, I wanted to ask somebody that would give me an answer that I knew I could trust and, and, and operate on safely safely and so I would ask mom oftentimes mom is this right or wrong Uh, here's the way I feel about this I'm having a hard time with this should I do this or should I not 
I just funny. I just had a uh, a remembrance of what that what one of those things were. I grew up in Allegheny Springs, and the property that my parents had was across a little creek, and we had a little private bridge that went across that creek. And every year in April, they would come and stock that little creek with trout. And the way the fishing season was, it opened on a Saturday at noon. And people would, you know, they would be all up and down that road scoping out the best fishing spot. Well, all I had to do was walk out on that little private bridge with my fishing pole and fish. But a lot of my country boy buddies, you know, they'd go ahead and fish ahead of season. They could sneak around. There are a lot of places you could get, you know, down over a bank somewhere and nobody could see you from the road and you could catch a few fish. So I was asking my mom, I know we ain't supposed to, I mean, it's noon when you're supposed to start fishing. Think anybody say anything? It'd be all right if I go on. I, I got my stuff here. It'd be all right if me go on and start fishing. Who's going to say anything to a little boy? And mom's answer at times like that, that was she had the wisdom to do this. She would say, Steve, what do you, what do you feel is the right answer? What do you think's right about what, what's that little voice inside of you saying is the right answer to this question? You know what? God put that little voice inside of all of us, but he, he took it to another level with the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, a believer. And there's, there's so many things that we need to know what's right and wrong and what really pleases the Lord, and He will show us, listen, some things might be wrong for you that are not wrong for somebody else. I know for a fact, I got friends that, that do some things I can't do. But I probably do some things that some, some of them can't do. One place in the Word, it says this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your... See, a couple things I need to say about that. One is, these days, I don't see evidence near enough fear and trembling. I mean, people in our day have just lost a healthy fear of God. But again, if God's already made it clear, you don't get to decide something different. But if there's a gray area, you need to humbly pray for clarity and guidance from the Lord and grace to obey once He shows you. As we seek Him during this season, we need to ask Him to sensitize us again to that leading and to make us people that are led by His Spirit and true to our convictions. Amen, Keith. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. God's church is when God's people realize who they are and purpose that with God's help they will be true to their calling in every way. That's real church. Real church is when God's people consecrate and dedicate themselves to submit to the Word and to the Holy Spirit and the continual, watch this, purging, cleansing, purifying work that the Lord is doing in them. That's real church. That's sanctification. Sanctification is an instantaneous 
and a progressive work of grace where a believer by faith accept God's calling to be set apart. That's the instantaneous part right there, by the way. When God's people quit trying to dodge that, quit, you know, a lot of God's people just say, well, you know, I, 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 I want to be forgiven, God, but I, I don't know if I... I don't know if I want to buy into to that total change you want to do in me. It's when a believer by faith accepts God's calling to be set apart and submits to his ongoing work of cleansing and purity. Have you submitted to the work that God's trying to do in your life? Have you really submitted? The finished product of this engagement is the presenting of a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it is holy and without blemish. God said for his church, that he's doing a continual work. I believe that he wants to do a consecrating work here this morning. I believe that he wants us to recommit to this engagement and to receive his grace to be set apart unto him to where we know and the world knows We've been spoken for. We belong to him. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me. Brittany, go ahead and put that track on softly. I envision a different kind of a closing to this service. Well, it's really not a lot different, but, uh, but it's some different. Because I believe that God wants to do a work here this morning in all of our lives, in His church, but in members in particular. And here's what I mean. I believe that He wants to do a sanctifying work today in us I believe that he's calling us to be a consecrated people and I believe that he will do that if we present ourselves to him and allow him to do it I believe the Lord's saying to us today again Will you be truly mine? Will you really be mine? I sense the Holy Spirit is massaging that into some hearts today. Will you really Accept the engagement of the Lord to be His forever. Language that we use when we do a wedding. Remember he said if we understand, if we understand marriage, we'll understand His relationship with the church. Here's language me as a pastor I often say when I'm doing a wedding for somebody. Part of the vows. Will you forsake all others and keep thee only unto me as long as you shall live? I believe the Holy Spirit speaking that to our hearts today. Will you forsake all others and keep thee only unto me as long as you shall live? Here's one. I 
believe he's saying this to us at this altar today. In the church with God's people, when his spirit and his word are moving so powerfully, will you leave your sins at the altar and receive my cleansing and empowering grace to righteousness? That's the opportunity that he affords us today. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to invite you to do something. I know I don't have to tell you this, but God's Spirit's moving here today. And the Holy Spirit's bearing witness with this word today in your heart and in your life. You know how I felt on the bank of Hartwell Lake when I said to Sheila, will you marry me? I was hanging on every phrase, every look in her eye, every tone of her voice. I was waiting for her to give me the answer. I believe God's looking at his church today. He's proposed. Will you say yes and mean it? If you will, I want you to join me at this altar. This church is going to, we're going to say yes to the Lord. This is what real church is all about. We're going to say we want to be. We, we want to be yours, Lord. We want to please you. We want you to set us apart today. We want you to consecrate us. We want you, Lord, to continue to deal with our hearts and and the stuff that's inside of us that needs to get out of us. We want you to work in it, Lord. We want you to cleanse us out by your blood. We want you to purge us. We want to be consecrated. Can you imagine heaven right now, the Lord looking out and looking at this? This is our response. Thank you for coming. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. But I'm going to ask you to personalize it. God wants you to personalize it. He's going to do something significant here today. Bow your heads with me, please. The first thing we got to do is, you know, there may be some folks here today that haven't formally accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They haven't invited Him to come into their life and just forgive their sins and to write their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to tell you it's a gift. It's a gift of grace. It's the only way you'll ever be eligible for heaven. If you've not prayed that prayer, we're going to pray that first. I'm going to pray right now, and then I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. If you need to pray that prayer, I want you to repeat the prayer after me when that time comes. And everybody up here is going to support you in that by doing the same. We're going to revisit it. Let me just pray for you now. Father, I thank you today for these, your people. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is moving. I thank you that you're drawing us closer to you. And Lord, I know there's possibly some people here that have never opened their heart to say yes to you and to invite you to come in and be Savior and Lord. But today they realize they need you and they want you and they hear your voice calling them. And they're ready to say yes to you and to let you come in. So Father, as we pray what's known as the sinner's prayer, I thank you that you will do just exactly what you said. You said if anybody would call upon my name, they shall be saved. 
So, Father, we're getting ready to call. Let faith arise in Jesus' name. Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly, I come to you today in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for making a way that I could be saved. I ask you, Lord, on the basis of your word, to forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. From this day forward, help me to live for you and to honor you and to please you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer and for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going, we got some more to do, but if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you prayed that prayer knowing that this is the time when you mean business with that, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing before you leave today. Tell me or Pastor Perry that you prayed that prayer to receive Christ. The reason for that is the scripture says with the heart we believe and with confession it's made into salvation. You'll, you'll, you're never going to tell anybody in a safer place than right here that you prayed that prayer to receive Christ. But you're going to have the opportunity to tell some people from now on that you are a Christian and that Jesus came into your heart. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray the prayer now to consecrate ourselves unto the Lord. We're going to ask the Lord to truly set us apart as if he would say, if this was us, to move us from where we've been to recognize that we are a vessel unto honor. And God says, you've been there, but I'm going to put you here. You're mine now. There's a special plan, a special purpose for your life. And we submit to that. Amen. Sanctification means once again, it's an instantaneous thing. It's when we recognize today, he didn't just call us to this, but if we receive it, a gift of grace, we accept the fact that he sets us apart. And he begins at that point to continually work in our lives to work out all the junk to keep perfecting us until one day he presents us to himself. Amen? Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, we come to you today thanking you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit and your Word is active and working here today. You, you started a work in us a long time ago and you are faithful to complete it all the way until we stand before you. But Father, we realize today in a new way that we're engaged to you. We're engaged to you. So Father, we ask you to set us apart. Willingly, Lord, we will allow you to set us apart from this world. It's more important then we are identified with heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. It is more important that we are identified with heaven and identified with our Lord than it is that we would be uh, identified with this world. We ask you, Lord, to set us apart. Set us apart unto you. In the name of Jesus, consecrate us. Consecrate us unto you, Lord.
Can anybody stop that? Father, we know that there is an ongoing, continual work in us. And we need you to keep working. We really want you to keep working, Lord. We want you to keep working. There's still some kinks and there's still some, some things of the flesh in us that need to be purged and cleansed and purified. Holy Spirit, purify us and cleanse us. Root out the stuff, Lord, that's not of you and that is not like you and is not pleasing to you. Root it out. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Sensitize us to your Holy Spirit, Lord. So that we hear that still small voice. Whenever there's a thing that we're just being pulled back and forth between the flesh and the spirit. Help us to hear that still small voice that says, this is the way right here. Walk in it. I will, I will grace you. I will help you to walk in it. Help us to hear that voice, Lord. And to follow you. Thank you, Lord, today for setting us apart. As your church today, we give you praise for your work. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Brittany, I'm going to ask you to, or Jamie, to fade that music out. Sheila, I want you to come up here and lead us in that chorus, I give myself away. Because that's what we're doing right here. We're asking the Lord. We're, we're presenting ourselves to say, Lord, here we are. We're yours. We want you to use us. Is that your mic that you normally use? Okay. I give myself away, I give myself away, so you can use me. I give myself away, I give myself away, so you can use me. Here I stand, Lord, my life is in your hands, Lord, I'm longing to see your desires revealed in me, I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Okay, I'm going to keep you just one more quick minute because there's something I need to tell you. I grew up in a full gospel church, preaching and teaching about salvation, sanctification, baptism in the Holy Spirit, divine healing, and the second coming of the Lord. And I've heard many sermons. This is one of the few recently that I've given talking about sanctification. But it's scriptural that sanctification is a valid 
Christian experience. Now, here's the part I really want you to catch. Most of the time, when people have received Christ as their Savior, it's not too tough for them to say, okay, I prayed that sinner's prayer, and I believe that Jesus saved me. But whenever someone is asked, are you sanctified? Have you been sanctified? So often people say, well, I don't know. I want to assure you something. Just like your salvation was a gift when you asked Jesus, you can't work and earn it. You can't, it, it's, it's a free gift. When you ask the Lord to consecrate you and to sanctify you and set you apart as his church for his work, and you ask in faith, that instantaneous part is his gift to you. The progressive part from here on out is also his gift, and it's something that's already active. So the thing I want to assure you on this morning, if you're standing at this altar, and if you prayed that prayer with me a while ago and asked the Lord to set you apart and to sanctify and consecrate you unto his work, you are sanctified. You're sanctified because that's what God's Word said it took to be sanctified. The rest of it's up to Him. Amen? Oh, I'm, I done started preaching real good again. So when, whenever you leave here today, if, you're, if you came to this altar and you sincerely prayed that prayer, and the question ever comes up, are you saved? Yeah. Are you sanctified? Well, yes, you are. Because one day you stood before God and said, Lord, I heard, you, I heard you propose to me. And I said, yes, by faith. By, yeah, by faith, I said, yes. And you belong to him now. So receive that free gift. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of grace. When it comes to the baptism in the Holy Spirit, again, the only way you'll ever get it is to receive a gift of grace. I grew up in the church again, and I often thought, well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I know that involves the gifts of the Spirit, that involves a, a, a prayer language, speaking in tongues, and all that stuff, and, and I'll know I got it when all of that happens. You'll know you got it. When you sincerely see God's word that says that he's poured out his spirit for his people and he wants you to have it and you ask him to fill you with, your, with his spirit, you ask him in faith and believe and just like that candle was the gift, you said, okay, thank you, Lord. That's the way we get our healing. That's the way we get everything. It's all by faith. The fruit and the evidence comes afterward. I love you guys.